Okay, we have to go down here. ضيوفنا الكرام رحبوا معنا بشيف كيمكا رئيس مجلس إدارة مؤسسة The Global Education and Leadership من الهند Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage Shiv Kemka, Chairman of the Global Education and Leadership Foundation, India Assalamu alaikum, good morning it's wonderful to be here this morning and uh, to see all these young people in the audience. Uh, thank you very much to MISC Foundation for inviting us here. It's a pleasure to be in this beautiful country. And we have a very interesting topic we're going to discuss, that of the ethical leader and the need for ethical leadership. So I want to start off with a few comments uh, about the state of our world today. And to begin with, I want to apologize on behalf of all the adults in the room and on the planet, that for all the young people here, we are giving you a world that frankly is in quite a big mess. We look at climate change and what's happening with the rising sea levels, with the huge migration and refugee crisis that's going to be created, with the fact that even today, in this modern age, over three billion people live on less than $3 a day uh, on a planet where the World Wildlife Fund has told us that in the last 40 years, 58% of the world's wildlife population has been wiped out, where 30% of our oceans are filled with microplastics, uh, and on and on and on. Three million people move every day from villages to cities, just in my country alone, 700 million people are going to move from villages to cities in the next 30 years. And the question is, how are we going to deal with these huge challenges? 800 million people sleep hungry every night on our planet. <clears throat> so at every level that you look, we see huge challenges ahead. And these are challenges that we and all the young people here and in the world will have to take on head first. Amazingly, in 2015, 193 countries got together and crafted the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals to frame the problem and to focus on the solutions to try and solve these problems on the planet. And not just for the 1 billion people that have wealth, but for the rest, for the 7.3 billion the total planet's population that needs a solution urgently, because over the next, by 2050, our population will rise to about 9.7 billion people. It took us 200,000 years to get to 1 billion people, and it's taken us less than 200 years to get to 7.3 billion people, and in another 30 years, we'll be at 9.7 billion people. So how will the Earth, how are we going to deal with this emerging crisis on the planet. So one, we've framed the solutions through the Sustainable Development Goals. But on the other hand, the great hope is that technology is going to save us. New technologies are coming very fast, artificial intelligence, digital technologies, computing power that we can, couldn't have imagined a few years ago, communication technologies, agri-technologies, biotechnologies, and many other things that will make 
all these problems potentially resolvable? And the question that I ask myself is, the technology in the hands of who? So the technology in the hands of unethical leaders will perhaps create more inequality. To even today, 42 people on the planet have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 3.7 billion. 1% of the planet has over 50% of the planet's wealth. 8% of the planet has 83% of the planet's wealth. So we need ethical leaders who actually take on the challenge of creating equity on the planet and reducing this huge inequality that exists. So we really need a new consciousness to emerge about the type of leaders we need amongst our young people. Almost a movement or a series of movements that will bring about a sense of the importance of having ethical leaders on our planet. And let's talk a little bit about ethics. What does ethics mean? Because in each culture, in each different religious tradition, there are deep discussions about ethics and a lot of complex analysis about what ethics is. But I want us here in this room to really talk about the very fundamental foundation of ethics, which is the golden rule, the golden mean, which exists in all world wisdom traditions, which is do unto others as you would them do unto you. So treat others the way you expect them to treat you, as a very basic platform for an ethical standard that we can all hopefully agree on. Treat your love your neighbor, treat your neighbor the way you would treat yourself, etc. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the great ethical leaders of the last century, said something very beautiful. He said, the world has created enough for our needs, but not enough for our greed. And so I'm optimistic that there is a solution, that amongst this room are many young people that will help be part of the solution. And I want, we have a fantastic panel of young leaders who are committing their lives to ethical leadership, to helping solve these problems. And I'd like to really now ask uh, Kareem and Eric to introduce uh, their lives, their work, and talk a little bit about what they do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, let me start by saying, Salaamu Alaikum. Thank you so much for having me in, in your wonderful country. It's been such a pleasure to meet and collaborate uh, with so many inspiring young leaders from all around the world. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my name's Kareem, uh, Kareem El Ansari. I'm from Australia, um, of Egyptian background. Um, I, I've spent the last, uh, I graduated fairly recently. Um, I studied the humanities, political science, international affairs. Um, and since then, I mean, it's always been on my mind, how can I have meaningful impact as a young person? How can I uh, live ethically in my own personal life, but then also have that uh, transcend to my work? Um, and I've, I've sought opportunities in organizations that are values-driven. So I started working for the Oak Tree Foundation, which is Australia's largest youth-run NGO, um, where everyone there is under 27 years old, uh, and none of us get paid. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that was a place where the, there was no financial incentive. The only reason you're there is for the impact that you're having. And, and the values that the organization um, aligns with. Uh, so for me, I've, I've tried to seek out opportunities that allow me to have uh, tangible positive impact. I, I led their major fundraising campaign called Live Below the Line, which is Australia's largest uh, digital fundraiser. And we, ra we were able to raise over the last eight years um, $11 million to support aid and development projects in the Asia Pacific. And as a group of young people, um, that's quite extraordinary. And it shows and, and speaks to the fact that we're not complacent citizens. It's of, often sort of attributed to us that we uh, are naive and idealistic. As young people, we don't know what we're talking about. Um, but I, I don't think that's true. You don't have to look very far to see the incredible impact young people are having all around the world, uh, whether that's you know starting huge organizations. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg was 19 years old when he started Facebook. Um, and uh, for me, ethics, uh, in order to lead teams and lead organizations, I think you have to really um, have a clear idea of what your own personal ethics are. I think that's where you start um, understanding what makes 
you tick what motivates you and what you care about. It's only then that you can start to pass that on to the people that you're working with and, uh, and have that trickle down through an organization. Um, just quickly, I now lead the Asia Pacific Youth Organization, which is a NGO in Australia focused on building the capacity of young people, trying to get them uh, involved in a meaningful way in public policy discussions and having them uh, have access to decision makers across the Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Eric. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's nice to see all your uh, beautiful faces from up here. Um, I actually want to start with a story. Um, it's a parable about a grandfather and his grandson. And the grandfather's upset, uh, and, and the grandson sees this, and he turns to his grandfather and he says, Grandfather, what's, what's wrong? And the grandson, grandfather replies to his grandson, My son, I feel like I have these two wolves fighting inside my spirit. And one wolf is vengeful and angry and violent, and the other wolf is loving and peaceful and kind. And they're at war inside my, inside my spirit. And so the grandson thinks about this for a moment and then turns to his grandfather and he says, Grandfather, which, which of these two wolves is going to win this battle? To which the, the grandfather replies, My son, whichever of these two wolves I choose to feed. I experienced a fair amount of violence as a young person. Uh, that wolf of, of anger and violence and revenge was fed uh, within me as a child. And I faced a moment of obligation, uh, which is one of the things I want to talk about, where I had to make a choice about who I wanted to be in the world. And for me, that started when I was 14. So when I was 14, I started uh, my own journey to making a difference in the world, um, organizing in my high school to make it more inclusive. And then I uh, got a scholarship to go to Harvard, which opened up a lot of doors for me, and started my organization, Peace First, uh, when I was 18. Really around this big idea, which is that young people are going to deal with all the problems of the world and are rarely invited to be part of the solution. Right? The way we talk about young people is as victims or perpetrators or the future. Right? We come into venues like this and we tell young people, you're the future. Right? Someday you all are going to be great leaders, writers, artists. Someday, which tells you what? Not now. Wait your turn. There are 1.6 billion young people on the planet between the ages of 13 and 25, and you all represent the single greatest untapped resource to change the world. Single greatest because you're closest to the problems and therefore closest to the solutions and you're not stuck in ways of thinking. And what we realized was nobody is calling this generation at scale. So what we've built is the world's largest digital platform for young people who want to change the world. So we help young people identify a problem, create a solution, and then we invest in young people's ideas. So we're raising a, a $10 million fund just to invest in young people. None of that money goes to adults, just directly in the hands of young people to change the world. And what we care about is how those problems get solved. How we solve problems matter. And so as we think about an ethical framework, our values are threefold. The first is compassion, crossing lines of difference to see other people's needs as our own. So in designing projects, young people need to interview people who are affected by the problem they want to fix, and they need to invest, they need to interview uh, people who are invested in the problem, right? Who are helping cause the problem and find that common ground. The second is courage, taking risks. For most of us, when we enter a situation, we ask, well, what can I, what do I get out of it, right? What's in it for me? Let's be honest. And then most of us can move to a place, what am I willing to give? What can I contribute? But we need to start asking, what am I willing to give up? How am I willing to be different to create that change? And then the third is collaborative leadership. The world is not going to change by the three of us up here on a panel, right? It's networks. It's people coming together, right? It's groups of people organizing to make the world a fairer, better place for everyone. And so what we are trying to do is, is unleash a generation of young people to change the world 
but doing it by being ethical leaders in the world. Thank you, Eric. One of the great challenges of our time as the populations burgeon, and in India, for example, 50% of our population is below the age of 25, 65% of our population is below the age of 35, similar demographics to Saudi. Uh, the question, the great challenge is, how do we create jobs for these young people? How do we actually get these young people engaged in this economy where technology is changing so fast that every few years the jobs that existed before are no longer relevant? Uh, and what are the ethics of those technologies? And how does one think about this massive job creation that's going to exist in the next 20, 30 years? How do we educate for that job creation? How do we create the jobs, etc.? And I know that you're doing something very interesting in Malaysia. Uh, the youth minister in Malaysia is 25 years old, a young person who's been made Minister of Youth Affairs and Employment. So I want you to talk a bit about what you're doing uh, yeah, in Malaysia. Absolutely. Um, so a core program that we're working on is um, what's it's called a policy lab framework. So our organization in the past um, has been focused on getting together a group of fantastic young people from across the Asia Pacific region. Um, and we've sent them to delegations to some of the key regional meetings, whether that be the APEC, ASEAN summits, the Shangri-La Dialogue. We've had them meet with senior decision makers at those meetings, participate in meaningful discussions, and, and ultimately uh, come up with a series of uh, recommendations. Well, what we didn't foresee is that it's wonderful, all well and good, to get uh, young people in a room with senior decision makers and they spend a, a portion of that time collaborating and chatting, but nothing actually happens after that. The report that we give them, we take a photo of it, um, and it sits on their desk. So a big question for us was how do we actually take that next step into implementation? Uh, have it transcend just being a symbolic gesture and actually become uh, a platform for young people to have tangible impact. Um, so what we decided to do was create this policy lab framework. It, it's essentially the same idea, um, but instead of going to these huge meetings and talking about uh, global issues, we focus on a particular policy problem. So this year, um, as Mr. Kemkar pointed out, we've been focusing on Malaysia and youth unemployment in Malaysia. Um, the youth unemployment rate in Malaysia is three times uh, what it is for uh, the general population. Um, and the government responses have been, um, whilst effective for some, have been uh, sluggish. So what we've been trying to do is get through this platform young people together, work on this problem, this particular problem of youth unemployment, um, use their skills, their experience, um, and the diversity that come of, of thought that comes with that, and come up with some tangible recommendations that we can pass on to um, the agency or, or government department responsible for implementing uh, change on that policy area. Um, I think, as you pointed out, Mr. Kemkar, as, as a young person, the world of the future, it, it, is, it is quite scary. Um, we don't know what's going to happen. We're three times more likely to uh, be unemployed than, a, than an adult. 85% uh, of jobs that will exist in 2030 don't exist now. So how do we actually prepare for that world? Well, it's a really difficult question. And I think the answer is we have to go back to what it means to be a human being and what value we have um, that can't be automated. Um, and to me, there, there are skills like collaboration, critical thinking, communications, uh, problem solving. They're things that um, are essential to what makes us uh, human, but the educational system has been lagging behind. Uh, and in, in Australia, the average 15-year-old now will have 17 jobs and five different careers in their lifetime. That's something that's unprecedented. We've never seen that happen before. Um, and the education system, having gone through it quite recently, I can tell you, it doesn't prepare us for that situation. At school, you're assessed on your ability to memorize facts, memorize paragraphs, and regurgitate that on an exam paper. Um, so I think we really need to think about how we can embed some of those more immersive, practical um, components of, of the working world into our education system. Thank you. Um, 
I come from a country where, which has one of the lowest participations of women in the workplace. And I think one of the big issues on the planet is uh, gender equality, treating uh, you know, all human beings with the same rights and the same values, uh, which is a deeply ethical issue. Uh, and I want to ask you, Eric, in your Peace First movement that you've started, what are you doing towards encouraging and supporting uh, a, a sense of gender equality in what you do? Um, it, it's a great question. Um, so we support young people right now in 126 countries who are tackling all sorts of issues from climate change to poverty. And one of the biggest is around women's inclusion. Um, so there are two interesting things that we're finding. The first is um, wanting to change the narratives, the stories about who women are. Uh, Jasmine Babers is a young woman who um, uh, subscribed to uh, magazines uh, when she was a kid and realized that all the magazines for young girls were about two things. They were about beauty and they were about boyfriends. So as a 15-year-old, she started her own magazine. Right? She's like a, she was like a 15-year-old Oprah. And it was called Love Girls Magazine. And it just featured stories about women's empowerment. Real stories of real girls, real women, not touched up in their photos, like real people telling their stories. And the second thing that's powerful, uh, and this is particularly for you gentlemen out there, um, is the role that men play in women's empowerment. There are amazing projects that young men are doing to change the way that men talk about women, who, the way they see women. Um, some really powerful campaigns that, that men are leading. And so the, the, the power in, in what we're trying to do is not trying to fix things, but giving young people the space to identify the problem, to create solutions, and then investing in them with real resources. Thank you. It's so important. Um, I want to... I think we all understand that if we are going to solve the problems that the world faces today, we need a generation of leadership and a movement of leadership that focuses on a leadership that is not totally self-focused, that's focused on the other, on solving the problems of our one world, our one planet. Because we may be able to solve the problems in India, but that doesn't mean we solve the problems of the planet. And so unless we have a more broad view of human beings on the planet as one family, I think we won't get there. And at the root of that, I believe, is something beyond materialism, beyond just money, uh, and, uh, which is something spiritual. It's difficult to explain. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi said it in a beautiful way. He said, all the world's religions and wisdom traditions are like rivers leading to the same ocean. So focus on the ocean and not on the river. So I want to understand your views uh, on do you think that a great leader needs to have some deep spiritual roots? Or can a leader be uh, a great leader without those roots? Eric. Um, so I'm, I'm going to just be honest. Um, we lie to young people all the time. And, and, and the way that we do that is the question that we ask you from the minute you can talk is what do you want to do when you grow up? Right? That's what we ask. What do you want to do when you grow up? The question we need to be asking is, who do you want to be when you grow up? Who you are is significantly more important than anything that you do. I talk to uh, CEOs all over the world about workforce development and, and what they're looking for. They don't talk about technology skills. They don't talk about math. They don't talk about STEM. They talk about having a workforce of ethical people of folks who can work across lines of difference, who can get along with one another. And, and those are the skills that, that, that we need to uh, invest in and support. And so I, I think that when I think about spirituality, what I think of is roots, those things that connect you, um, that sense of equanimity of being grounded in the world. Um, and you only get that from understanding who you are and what your value is. Thank you. Kareem. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I, I would agree. I think, well, the average tenure for a CEO now is between three to five years. So what that means is that you are 
with that limitation. There's this sort of thing of short-termism, and it happens in politics as well. They're not taking the long view. They're not thinking about the wider issues of climate change, uh, economic inequality, the gender pay gap. I think that young people our age, um, well, young people in general, are starting to gravitate towards those organisations that do have that wider angle. They are thinking about those big picture issues and they're starting to embed that into their business practices. Um, there's a lot of work at the moment being done in Australia around modern slavery in the supply chain. We import a lot of our goods from the Asia Pacific where conditions for workers are horrendous. Um, and many people in Australia are blind to what's actually going on and when they're making a decision about what they're purchasing, they're not sure what, what actually is happening. So more transparency around that, I think, is an incredible thing. To get to the, the uh, spiritual uh, side of the question, I think, well, as a, as a young Muslim myself, um, core to my identity uh, is my faith. Um, and who I am has come from that. Uh, it's a great starting point, I think, when you're in a position of leadership or trying to affect change, as I said earlier, to really get to know yourself quite well. Um, and have a strong sense of who you want to be in this world, not just what you want to do. Um, and I've tried to, uh, to live by that in my own life. I think faith, and faith often is positioned in contrast to science. Uh, I think that they can work together. I don't see, um, I think that's a false dichotomy. Um, and I think that if we, if we start to appreciate the value of faith, and of spirituality and start to embed that into our decision-making processes, everyone will be better off. Thank you. Uh, my view on that, uh, my view on that, I, I, I've had a very uh, nomadic life. I left India when I was 11, I had bad asthma, moved to France, lived there for a year, moved to England, went to boarding school, attended chapel every day, uh, even though I was born into a Hindu family with a Sikh mother. Uh, I studied the Quran. Later in my life, I studied Buddhism. And uh, I really believe that we are spiritual beings having a human experience, as a great French philosopher said, rather than human beings having a spiritual experience. And therefore, if we actually do want to get to know ourselves, we need to understand what is most important within us, within us which is our connection to that which is divine, in whatever way we frame that. Uh, and so I believe great leadership actually rests on great spiritual depth. And I think that's extremely important. And if our young people embrace that and don't run away from that, because it's not cool to, to say that, but if one really understands that actually what is really important is actually what is connected to the divine, I think that will allow one to be the best one can be in terms of the type of leaders the world needs. Uh, before I open up to the floor for some questions, I want to end with a small story. Sherlock Holmes, the great uh, detective, the great British detective, and Watson are out in the desert, and they're camping they're under their tent, they're camping in the desert, and Sherlock Holmes wakes up uh, Watson late at night and says, look up. He says, Watson, what do you see? And Watson looks up and he goes, he knows that Sherlock Holmes is a very clever guy, so he's going to He's trying to answer it in every possible way. So he looks up and he goes, well, astronomically speaking, I can see that, uh, you know, uh, the moon's position and the position of the stars tells us that this is what's happening. Uh, astrologically speaking, I think that, you know, uh, cancer is moving into Leo, so we must be in August. Horologically speaking, I think it's about three in the morning. Uh, meteorologically speaking, I think there's a slight wind and I think rains are coming tomorrow. And theologically speaking, Sherlock, I think if you look at the stars above and all the beauty, I think that God exists because you can't imagine such perfection without God existing. And Sherlock turns to Watson and says, Watson, you fool, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> so I think leaders need to be practical. They need to understand that someone has stolen our tent. The world where we are today is like the Titanic heading into an iceberg. And we need ethical leaders to step up. We need everyone, a movement of young people that will actually get up and start to make a difference at scale on the planet in time 
to solve the problems we have. I'd like to open the floor up for questions. Uh, number one, please. Please introduce yourself and direct the question. Um, hello there. Uh, my name is Saad Al Shalhoub, a senior from Riyadh Schools. Um, if we ignore the financial uh, crisis and look deeply into one of the main problems, which is finding a job. Can you hear? I know that everyone... We can't hear very well, I'm afraid. Um, okay. Um, I have a question to Mr. Kareem. Um, if we ignore the financial problems and look deeply into one of the main problems, which is finding a job, I know that everyone has a talent and everyone is a master in his world, but how can we find a way to make our fake worlds reality? Can you hear this question? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's quite difficult to hear you, sir. Um, apologize. With the question around how to find a job? Yeah, um, if we ignore the financial problems and look deeply into one of the main problems, which is finding a job, Finding. Everyone has a, has a talent, and everyone is a master in his world, but how can we find a way to make our fake worlds a reality? Okay. How do we find a way to make your talents, your dreams a reality? <laughs> okay. Like, how can we find a way to find jobs, like good jobs? Find jobs. Um, yeah. Okay. Jobs that we are good, uh, good at. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a really important question. Um, I think... You have to start with, um, ask yourself, what is it that I'm passionate about? I think that's where it starts. Um, what is it that I, when I'm doing it, time just goes? And I don't think that I'm working and I feel so strongly about this thing that I can't imagine not doing it. I think that's probably where you want to start. Once you've figured that out, figure out, I suppose, what problem you want to solve. Um, and there are so many out there. And I think if you start with the problem, clarity starts to emerge around the solution. There are jobs, as I said, there were jobs in, in 2030, there are going to be jobs that just don't exist now. So you can create. It doesn't necessarily have to be something there, saying, I'm going to be an engineer and solve this problem. It can be, I want to solve this problem. This is how I think I'm going to solve it and go out there and, and try and, and solve that problem. Um, and you may very well create something or create a new job in itself. OK, another question? Number four, please. Assalamu uh, alaikum. My name is Anwar Liswaik, a high school student. I'm uh, one of the winners of Rashid Rashid Award for Leadership, Creativity, and Talent. My question is for Mr. Eric. Uh, what is the most important skill so I can have, I should have it uh, to be, uh, so I can start to change the world into a better place, uh, especially in my age? First of all, I, I love the question. Um, thank you. Um, so I, I'm, we only have a little time left. I'm going to give you all some homework, uh, so I apologize in advance. Um, we are um, going to be working uh, with the Miss Foundation actually to do a Middle East Regional Youth Innovation Challenge. Um, so we are going to um, ask all of you to go to our website, peacefirst.org, and to begin creating a project to make your community better. Um, there are three things I want to leave you with about what you can do. Um, first of all, you don't need to wait. Right? You can do this as a young person, and we've got your back. We will support you in anything you need to make this happen. The second is, we need you to do this. Uh, you cannot wait. Um, without you, the world is going to collapse. No pressure. But we need you to make a difference. We cannot sit at the sidelines anymore. And the third thing is, who you are matters. Um, I was sitting with a, a young man who just graduated from Harvard Law School, just gotten married, and he was distraught about what, what, which of three paths to take to make the most difference. And I finally said to him, just be a good husband, right? Figure that out, right? Give your seat up to someone on the subway. Say good morning, right? So we want to support you all to create social innovations to improve your community, and we want to help you be good people and support you to be those ethical leaders you already are. Thank you. Number three, please. 
Um, hello, my name is Nisha Desai. Uh, this is my first time in Saudi Arabia, and I run an investment firm in New York that only invests in women-owned, oriented, and managed companies. Um, and my question is for Shiv. Uh, you and I both know that it's going to take billions of dollars uh, to, to transform um, you know, the world and to, to hit the SDG goals, particularly the ones on women. Um, and I, like you, am a Wharton alumni, so um, I believe in private equity and capital markets to uh, be a catalyst for just transformation. But I haven't seen all the big private equity firms like Apollo, for example, or sovereign wealth funds um, have women only dedicated funds. Not because it's just ethical. Um, in my experience, it's made money. So I'm investing in women, not just because it's a good thing to do, because it's the smartest thing to do as an investor. So how can you be a catalyst for that? And what do you say to sovereign wealth funds and your senior private equity guys about that? Thanks so much for the question, and congratulations on what you're doing. I think it's really important, and great you went to Wharton. Um, I, am a, I, I think the work you're doing is very important. Unfortunately, these things take time to change because it's about mindsets. It's about, uh, you know, not just talking about diversity and not just talking about uh, these things, but actually putting them into practice, testing new boundaries. And uh, mindset is the hardest thing to change, unfortunately. Uh, the amount of money needed to solve the world's problems actually is not that much. We need about three to four trillion dollars a year for the next 12 years to solve the SDGs. The problem is we're spending a very small amount. We're only spending about $140 billion a year on that. Only 7% of the funds needed are going towards trying to solve these problems at scale. Um, and so I think what you've said is very important, but I think it's about mindset, and it's about actually everyone stepping up to the plate, and therefore we need a movement, we need leaders, we need young people who demand these types of things from the leaders that exist on our planet. And I think only that way will we actually start to make the difference. But I think you're, you've hit on a very important point. I think we've sadly run out of time. And uh, thank you all very much. I'd like to thank MISC Foundation, and I'd like to thank the organizers who have done a great job. And I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists and the audience. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>